up, everybody? Um, you know, we a little late because we already got into a deep, heavy <laughs> conversation, and so we almost forgot that we had uh obligations. I'm here with our, <laughs> I'm here with my good friend Thomas L. Harris, director, um, actor. Uh, this guy, this guy's done it all, and he's doing it all. And um, I thought he would make for a great, great conversation. Um, what's up, man? How's it going? What's going on, man? You, it's, everything's good. You know how we do, man, when we link up. You know, we can talk yeah. for hours and hours and hours. Exactly. And the know. energy is just, like, I like I feel like I can go hoop or, like, I'm just ready to go. So um, you just got me fired up. I'm glad you was able to make some time for me this morning. Um, oh, Thomas, did I lose you? You frozen? Not frozen already on me, are you? All right, let's see if we can get Thomas unfrozen. Thomas, can you hear me? All right, so we having some immediate, immediate technical difficulties. We're going to get it straightened out. We got so much to talk about. Um, we actually was just in a deep conversation about um, this whole 6 9 situation. And so if you uh, are hip to pop culture and um, you know what's going on there, then you are definitely aware of all the uh, all the activity around 6 9 And um, we want to get into that. We're going to get into Thomas's new movies, um, all the writing that he's doing. He just logged out. He's about to log back in right now so we can bring him in. But um, uh this is about to be a great conversation full of energy. Thomas is uh, one of those guys that he just like every time you talk to him, like it's never a dull moment. Like he's just just very, very. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He's just very motivated. And uh, when you talk to him, I feel like you have to kind of raise your energy level. So you'll see me kind of in a different space today, which is cool because, you know, I do have that side of my personality, but usually in these live conversations, you know, I want to be a little more relaxed and uh, connect with my audience and really listen. But it's it's impossible for that to happen when me and Thomas connect. So um, he's letting me know that he's logging in right now and we'll jump into this conversation. Hopefully everybody's having a good Sunday morning. Um, the sun is shining. So that's good. Um, we have our new our new layout. Um, so if you can see, like I have my uh, my um, sponsor page background, which needs to be modified a little more. So we're just playing with a few little updates. And uh, there we go. Yeah, I don't know what just happened. But all right, I'm back. A, 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 a Wi-Fi glitch. <laughs> I don't. I might have. You know, it's crazy. I might have hit the button when I was doing my live, and it okay. might have hit the power button on my phone. I mean, on my uh computer. I think yeah, that's it's, right. it's um. You know, that's that's what happened when you're working with technology, man. You had the mercy. Yes. You had the mercy of uh of the internet and if of a click of a button. button. Yeah, the click of a button. So bad Wi-Fi. Yeah, and that's that's, sure. that's part of the the new normal. Like we adapt <laughs> to these things that we have no control, yeah. over, right? So yeah, because back in the day, it was it was you know you had to make sure your 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 dictation was perfect, man. Make sure you said everything without stuttering. So yep. now it's like that yep. and the internet and yep. the Wi Fi and the click of a button. So yep, yeah, one hundred one hundred percent. So look, before we jump into this uh incredible conversation that we're about to have. Give everybody just a little brief background about, you know, some of the things that you've done and, and who you are. Uh, so, you know, like you said, I'm Thomas L. Harris. I um, I am a filmmaker. I am a director, actor, and uh, a coach, uh, acting coach, also a writer. And um, I went to school for ooh, eight or nine years for acting. I went to Wayne State University. I studied there um, under some great, great uh, coaches and, and mentors. Um I left there and I started my own company with a couple of friends. We all started a company called Project Theater Company. It's actually where me and Rob met. Um, me, Rob, and Kurt. Um, it's a funny story. Me, Rob, and Kurt. I actually met Rob. Met you through Kurt. Yep. And Kurt knew my uncle, and I was looking for a job at, at uh, and I had needed a job that summer. I was fresh out of college, needed a job, and I remember uh, my uncle reached out to Kurt and was like, you know, he needed a job, and we linked up at Spirit. 
Nice. Street Airlines. And um, and I remember that. Well, I, I, didn't even, I didn't even realize that you like you were con- like Kirk, uh, Kirk knew a family member. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he was, Kirk already went back. No, he worked with my uncle. They okay. worked together. Okay. And uh, that's how they knew each other. And that's how I ended up getting the job at Spirit through Kurt and you. Yeah. And uh, that's how we met. Um, and and so uh, yeah, that 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 was that was that was like two thousand four, two thousand three, two thousand four. That was two thousand and uh, two thousand eight. Two thousand eight. No, two thousand seven. 2007. Okay. Yeah, remember, we were supposed to go to the All Star Weekend that weekend. 2000. Yeah, we was in Vegas. In, in, Actually, Vegas. Y'all went. in Vegas. In Vegas. Yeah. All Star Weekend in Vegas. We went. You didn't make it. No, I didn't make it. Yeah. I didn't make it there. Y'all the went. Greatest, the greatest All Star Weekend of all times. Like, and that's what I heard. And that's what I heard. I heard that it was the uh, it was one of the, the biggest ones. So. Yeah. But yeah. But um. And then after that, we started a uh, theater company. And uh, the theater company. Uh, it did good. We think we 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 lasted for about four or five years doing plays, and then um we linked up with uh T and B, which is Moolah Films now, and, and director BG, he's his own direct. They do their own thing now, and um and me and T kind of just rolled from there. We've been doing films since two thousand and ten. Yeah, man, that's yeah. uh that's funny. You you really took me down memory lane because you and uh Henri was an incredible force, like. Yeah, you, know, you kind of came out of the gate. That's that was really, I feel like the first introduction to local acting talent that I think I came across. And so it was interesting. And you guys wasn't necessarily into the film aspect as much you was, as you was into like plays, yeah, and, uh, and theater and mm-hmm. things like that. So like, how how has that transition been? Like, is that still a passion as well? Have you kind of like uh-huh. learned to? Oh yeah. Oh, one thing about one thing about acting on the stage is nothing like it. There's no there's no adrenaline rush like it. There's no it's nothing like it. It's live. Mm-hmm. You know, you can hear the reaction from the people. You know, um, your adrenaline is pumping. You know what I'm saying? You, right. you, you it's just nothing like the stage. Stage is is the greatest passion. I I still love stage to this day. I don't do it. I haven't done it in years. I, I'm gonna get back to doing it. Um, been so caught up in doing films and things like that, but most your most your 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 top trained actors they love stage, right? They love because because yeah. there's nothing like stage. I always hear um like really successful actors who've done like you know multi million dollar projects will always say like their dream is to be on Broadway or their yeah. dream, you yeah. know, kind of like for us, I guess. Hollywood and movies get elevated on such a high pedestal mm-hmm. and um just like broadway and plays uh, like a lot of people enjoy them but i don't think it's as celebrated like it's not as mainstream as movies and things like that if that's not like your cup of tea so to speak yeah because i think it's a it's a um i think when you start talking about plays plays just is something that if you've never been to a player exposed to a play you just probably don't know Right. But the films are put on a media. So everybody right. watches TV. Everybody watches, you know, now the internet or right. you get off your phone. I mean, it's so easy to access those things now. Um, plays, you, you you know, you got to get up, go buy the ticket, sit, watch the play. You know, it, it's it, it's not as convenient as it as you know a, a television. Right. Um, because it was super duper big back in the, you know, up until you know, till the beginning, up until what. Like in a different era, basically. Yeah, like maybe the 90s, it started to slow, late 90s, it started to slow down a little bit, maybe 2000s, because of, you know, obviously how the technology took a turn, right. you know, the internet and, and and all that stuff. But I mean, it's still big now. You still get, you still can make a, a living on Broadway, a big living, you know, it's still big. It still makes money. But, you know, um, it's just one thing that I think if you're an actor, you got to do it. Right. Like you have to hit that stage. There's no feeling like it. Yeah, it's like a crack Like I'm a crack. I'm addicted to it. Like I'm just addicted to the stage. At one point, I was really addicted to it. Like right. I loved it that much. I love doing it. I love. I just love the craft of 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 um, acting, and I love doing it on stage. So, so where where did that passion come from? Like, what do you if you think back to like your childhood, oh, yeah. being young, were you? Six years old, running around impersonating like yeah, characters. yeah. We always, we always, me and my brother, uh, we used to, we used to run around and, and do wrestling stuff. Like walk through the ring, we'd walk through the front door to the to the hallway to the living room. And the living room was the was the wrestling ring. 
So we'd all walk through there, and I, I thought I was Razor, uh, uh, Razor Ramon, or or I was Bret Hart, and my brother would be Jim Saw, you know, coming through. You're the, you're the WWF man. Yeah, and so which was fun until they start actually doing the moves on me. Then it wasn't fun. <laughs> then it started to hurt, you know, slamming me from the top bunk onto a a little thin old twin size bed mattress. Right, right. You know, then it wasn't fun, but it started. I think it kind of started there. I was always a, a, a like just a. Um, a very hyper kid. Like I just love making people laugh. I love playing sports. And I think where it took a turn for me was I was 10 years old and my mom made me and my brother go watch the movie Malcolm X. Okay. And so at 10 years old, we didn't want to watch Malcolm 10 right. years old. You don't know no better. Right. That probably was the only three hour long movie I ever sat through and wanted to go see again. Mm. And at 10 years old, I literally was like, mom, I thought Malcolm X was, was dead. I thought he, he died. I thought Denzel thought was really at Malcolm X. I thought I asked my mom that she she started laughing like no that's an actor. I'm like actor, right. and I think that's when I started to re I started reenacting everything. I was reenacting, don't be a menace, menace boys, and I was reenacting with my friends everything. Right. And when I got grown, when I, when I got out of high school, um, kind of didn't know where I wanted to go, so I went to school uh, at Wayne County. And my uncle, he was an actor here in Michigan. He was an actor. Um, he had a re- he was well respected um, in the acting play community. Okay. Um, and uh, he always he pushed me to to you know try it out. He said, "Go ahead, try it out." He knew he knew that I was a a really funny guy. He knew that I was always a, a charismatic. You know, I was just I was always the person that liked to make people laugh and enjoy. So he said, "Try it, try your hand in that." And um, and I remember I went and I did it and I did my very first play. I don't even think I had no lines. I was just like up there just doing like movements and stuff. Mm-hmm. And he critiqued me like I played the lead role. Like he was on my head. He critiqued me. He was like, how he you going to call something in you? Yeah. He was like, how you going to stand up there and, and keep drinking? You Then you drinking, you done took 30 shots, but you ain't drunk. Right. You know what I'm saying? And so it lit a fire in me. And that's when I got accepted to Wayne State and I played, I had played football there. Okay. And so um, when I went to play football and I was doing acting, the two began to collide. And I had to pick. And so, of course, I picked, you know, acting on top of I had a, a son on the way. So I picked acting. And um, he came to all my plays and he was a drill sergeant. You know what I'm saying? And I think my last, I think my last year there, might have been my last year or my second to last. I can't remember. But it was a play I did where I played an older guy. And um, I had really, 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 really been working hard on that role. Um mm-hmm. The director was a cool Kudogo who's like my ment- was my mentor, it still is. And um she was really we were really working, 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 working. And uh after the play was over, after this done, he seen it, he just winked and said. And it was like after that, when I got that approval from my uncle, right? It was, it was yeah, I was good to go. I was rolling. I was gone. So I, I never looked back. That's um that's funny. So, like, all these years I've been knowing you, like 2007, what, 13, going on 14 years, I didn't know you went to Wayne State. Mm-hmm. I definitely didn't know you played football. Like, I only yeah, know, I you play, I know you to play basketball. What position did you play in football? Corner. I you, played cornerback. Yeah, okay. I played cornerback. Football, and, and I wasn't really – see, I didn't – I wasn't really uh, – I didn't work in the offseason. I was one of them guys that worked during the season. Okay. And I didn't realize such at a young age that that's not really when you get better. <laughs> you, you, you don't really get better in the in the in season. You get right. better off season. Right. And so I just remember I had a hard nosed coach, hard nosed football coach. And he just put it on the line. If you don't do it, go home. Take your stuff off. How bad you really want it. Right, right. If you don't do what I tell you as far as like, you know, covering your make sure you got your coverage is right, making sure you make the tackles, things like that. If you go half ass, go home. What and high then, school did you go to? Huh? I went to a high school, uh Countback High School in Phoenix. So oh, I graduated okay. school in Phoenix, Arizona. So I was always, as a kid, back and forth from, you know, D- Southwest Detroit, E-Course, you know, Rouge area in Michigan, and then Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah. And um, so I ended up graduating from Camelback in 2000, and I'm not telling y'all. And, uh, <laughs> and then I came back, and then I came back here for good. That's what's up. So, so um, in college, like you're going, you know, you're switch. You decide to switch to theater and 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 make that kind of like your full focus. Did you ever envision an actual life as an actor, coach, director, or was this like a hobby that you felt like you would kind of yeah. always play with, but you had your sights on other things? Um, 
No, I, I would. Once, once, like I said, once I, once my uncle and I, you no, know, once my uncle came and I and and I and I and he seen that the growth, I began to get better and better, and he was like, "This is you." I was like, "This is what I want to do." Okay. I didn't know how though. Right. You know, I didn't know how because one thing in college they don't teach you is the is the business side. Right. They don't teach you the, you know, how how to survive. Right. They don't teach. They teach you solely acting. So I didn't know anything else but acting. Um, and then I had a son, so I knew I wasn't leaving. You know, one thing I, I, I always uh, said is I'm never going to leave him. I'm never going to leave his side, so I'm going to be here. So mm-hmm. I had to start figuring out things of how I'm going to do it here. Right. You know what I'm saying? And right. I think one of the things that lit the fuel in me to drive me to be independent like I am now is in college. When I was in college, I was I didn't get a lot of roles in college. You know, it was certain people that got certain roles. Now, mind you, when I was there, Wayne State might have been uh, maybe 200 people in the, in the theater program. I mean, I don't even know. I'm guessing right now. 200 mm-hmm. people, I'm guessing. Not, not, not mm-hmm. many. Yeah, and, and out of the 200, 25 were black. You know, maybe less than that. And so it wasn't many roles. And so certain people kept getting the same, kept getting those roles, you know, over and over every year. And I just kept saying, what the hell? Right. So we had one black play a year. And so... I think I got one role one two years, and then my friend he got a role two years. So, but that was the only time we were working once a year. Right. You know, everything else was like stand right here and hold this, or stand right here and hold this, or do this. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't nothing serious because they had the same people they always pick two right. people they always pick from, and so it began it began to come kind of clickish, kind of like you know you starting to see like hold on now the same people getting the same you know what I'm saying like yeah. and I know that and I'm standing out looking like I know that person is way better than that person. Right. How did that person get that? You know what I'm saying? Right. And I started learning that it's politics. I started learning that people it are has human. More to, it's not just about your ability and your talent. Like it's yeah. it's, No, it's not. And so mm-hmm. I think that was the advantage I had over everybody because I saw it then and there. Right. And so what I did was I said, all right, cool. They used to do this thing called the one X. And so the one X are student uh, produce things. You get to do it. You can go. It's like you get 30 minutes, 40 minutes to premiere your stuff on stage at a little studio theater. You know what I'm saying? Because Wayne State had three theaters. They had the studio, which is a very small one, maybe like mm-hmm. 120 seater. Then they had the Hillbury, which was the master's program. So people from all over the world came to study at the Hillbury. Right. And then they had the undergraduate, which we were in, studio in the undergrad, which is the Bonsdale, which is on Woodward. Okay. The big theater, the 1500 seater. So I had said, all right, bet. I'm going to write my own stuff that my people can relate to that we can understand, you know what I'm saying? And, and everybody can work. I could put everybody in it, you know what I'm saying? Right. As many people as I can. Um, and I said, all right, cool. I'm going to do that. Let's do it. So I, I called up all these um, uh, actors, they, you know, the black actors in, at, at the time. I called them all. I said, let's, let's have a meeting. Ooh. I had learned about a pl- about a, a group of a theater company that was the first black theater company in America in the 1820s. So I was really intrigued by it. So I went and got all this literature on it, just books and books and books on it. Come to this meeting. I'm just like spilling out everything. We're going to do this. You know, let's write it. I'll write it. We act. Woo-woo. And everybody like, yeah, cool. So I'm like, all right, bet. First writing session is tomorrow at 10 a.m. And nobody showed up except Henri. So uh, me and Henri, uh, Henri came through and he's like, let's do it. And so me and him, we worked on it and we wrote it. And we go to turn it in for a, a student produce um show we as a student right just to get approved for us to do it as students like we got to provide everything we got to provide the clothes and all that we do so we understand all that so the director of of the program Blair Anderson then he gives me a call and says hey I'm not gonna student produce this he says next year for the year 2000 I think it was eight I'm gonna make you a part of the Wayne State program and we're gonna fully fund this whole play and so he fully funded the whole play. The same people, it's crazy because the people that disliked it or whatever, they had to audition for the play for us. These are students, our peers, have to audition for us. Wow. And I remember it was crazy because when we got approved, I, I just, I, I was like, what? Like, I was like, really? I was like, us? That's good to be true. Okay, cool. I'm like, cool. But I was like, I played it cool. Like, cool, cool. Thanks, man. Cool. Right, right. And I, right. Going, I was like, yeah, hell yeah. You know, I was going crazy. Like, ah! <laughs> Caught on. He's like, yeah, he went crazy. So fast forward to the premiere of the play. We had a lot of stuff going on. Like, we had some racism going on. You know, we go to the to the costume design where we get our fitted for our costumes. And it was black dolls hanging from the thing where we're supposed to get our stuff. 
Yeah, and so we we had racist comments. You know, people that had to do the lighting would say like, "This ain't gonna sell." You know, this who wants to see this black, this play by black people, whatever they you know. Right. And so we went through a lot, and to let you know that God is so good, we sold out seven productions, standing room only. Wow. Every production, there was not one production that did not get sold out. So was that the start of Project Theater Company? That was the start of that right there sparked something in me, and I know it sparked something in Henri as well. Right. And I think me and him said, "Yo, we got to do this. Right? Like we got we got to take it in our own hands, and we got to do it." And I think that's when we started Project Theater. Myself, Henri, Anton Bassi, Elena, uh, Elena. Uh, dang, I forget. Elena gonna kill me. Elena. Uh, oh my God, Elena gonna kill me. That's hey. my sister. I love her too. Right. Elena Fleming. Woo, don't kill me, sis. Um, and uh, Christina Johnson. We right. started Project Theater Company, and it's crazy because you I, I don't know did we yeah we did we know each other we did know each other in Project Theater we did mm -hmm. um we were doing plays and I remember we had these great plays they were so good right you know and the acting was so great you know we fresh out of school we we, right. we you know what I'm saying we 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 just and you, were, you were doing all of it you were writing acting yeah we're writing we're directing we're acting we're doing it for the love of it you know what I'm saying yeah. right. but again we didn't know the business of it so we were losing money we weren't making no money right in right. the in the I would say in the three years we actually were active doing stuff, we didn't make no money. Listen, look, let's stop there because this is this is good practical insight to entrepreneurship. Isn't it crazy how you have like when you love something and you're passionate about it, you have absolutely no problem losing bread doing it. Like you will lose the entire house, the car, no. <laughs> like no. you go completely under. No, I look. You love. I it didn't so give a damn. I'm like, how much? I'm gonna go work some overtime. <laughs> right. And we did. We, I mean, look, we we loved it. Yeah. We loved it. We we went on stage every night. If it was one person, there, it didn't matter. Didn't we matter. gave it our all. We right. loved it that much. We knew we weren't gonna make no money. We didn't care. No, we didn't care. We, we, we didn't care about that at that time. Yeah. All we cared about was, was performing, was acting. That's what we loved to do. We wanted to do it. And we knew we had a talent. Yeah. Um, but if I could go back to that age, Thomas, I would tell him to learn marketing, learn it, yeah. understand it. You know what I'm saying? It's great to have that passion and that love, but it means nothing if you never learn the business side. You have yeah. to learn the business you have to well i mean I, and i think that's i mean i think that's experience though you know it's like it's like there's there's so much there's so many people missing that component like that yeah. component that you have that a lot of us have where we have a real true passion and love for what we do yeah it yeah really is flipped where the person want to make money so bad yes understand the business so bad yeah. And yes. they the passion piece, and now it's like that's not sustainable. Like you, yes. can't, you can't really become a great successful entrepreneur um, on any type of high level without some component of passion. Because the adversity that you're gonna hit, the amount yes. of struggle that you're gonna go through, um, yes. the setbacks that you're gonna have, like you can't deal with that and encounter all that and still expect to push mm -hmm. through if you don't have that that love and that kind of burning desire to do it. Yeah, you can't, because the thing is, I always tell people that when they ask me when they get into this, which I'm talking about on my coach's corner topic tonight, you know, uh, are you chasing the fame or are you chasing the craft? It, it's a it's a difference, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, it's just a big difference, you know? If you're chasing the fame, good luck. Yeah. You you know, one thing about chasing the fame, you might get famous. That 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 is an actual fact. Yeah. You might get famous, but how long? Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. At what cost? Right. You see what I'm saying? And people always say, I want to be found. Can you handle it? Yeah. Can you handle it? Because see, we always see the, the good things about being famous. We see the, the cars, trips, the, the red carpets. We don't never see the other side. Yeah. The, the 46 million views on YouTube in 24 hours. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Ain't that crazy? But you don't under, and, you, and it's funny you say that. We see that, see, everybody sees that part, but what about the part of you can't sleep at night? Right. You can't, you can't walk down the street and enjoy your life. Right. 
You know what I'm saying? The small things that make happiness. Yep. See, everybody thinks money and the internet, I think, has the social media has, especially with the young generation, not me, maybe not, maybe not me and you, because we came up in an era where there was no social media when we were kids. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Me and you, we we came up in an era where you had to still call people on the house phone. Right. Or you had your own phone in your room. Well, yeah, we you know connected, we connected differently. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? In class, we had to pass a letter to the girl we liked when we were in third grade. Right. Fold it up. And, uh, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I think the, the little things is why we have a foundation of how we know a happiness is true happiness. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are missing out on that because the small things, being able to take your kids somewhere, being able to spend time with your kids at a park or at an amusement park or at a movie or at a, you know what I'm saying? The, the small things that will catch up in the long run. You might not feel it now, but it will catch up. Right. You know what I'm saying? And I think that's just one of the things that we never see the other side. We always see the glitz and the glamour until a movie come out and you go, damn, I didn't know that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. The back. Yeah. Right. yeah. They and never we, showed that. We, we, and we should stay there because that's actually what got us coming on a little late because um, we we brought up this topic of 6 9 and all of the craziness surrounding that yeah. entire situation. And I think it really speaks to what you're talking about. Yeah. This is solely about attention and what mm -hmm. people are focused on. It has yeah. nothing to do with talent. It has no. nothing to do with craft. No. Like it has nothing to do with any of those kind of like mm -hmm. core sustainable things. Mm -hmm. um, and like, essentially we talked about like, he's on the clock, like he's on the clock. Unless he changed significantly, mm -hmm. he's probably on the clock in terms of either going back to prison or something, you know, uh, mm -hmm. tragic happening or mm -hmm. like, you know, like it's just, you can sense mm -hmm. like the story does not yeah. fail if something doesn't change. And I think, I think our generation and, and young and older understand the severity of it because we lived through the Tupac and the Biggie. Right. And we see, you know, as kids, I didn't see it, you know what I'm saying? But my dad did. Right. My dad knew it. You know, my dad saw it because he lived through it when he was a kid, you know, younger. So I think that we understand it, you know, saying we see it, but a lot of people may not. And one thing about music, you know, your music might be hot these five years, but music takes a turn every 10 years or so. Would you say about yeah. 10 years? Well, every yeah, 10 I years. Think, I think it's getting, I think it's that gap is closing because of technology. So yeah. once upon a time, it might have been 10, it might be, you know, a little less than that. Yeah, I mean, you you know, we had gangster music, gangster music, and conscious music in the right. '90s. You had you had your your NWAs, you had your Ice Cube, you had all those guys. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? In the in the '90s, Tupac, Biggie, and then on the other side in the '90s, you had T Talib Kweli, you had your Nas, right. you had your Most yeah, Def, you had you had you know you had that that era of, of hip hop. Yeah. In the 2000s, it was more like that. You know, it was more like the, the South took over. You know, the, the South sound. The then franchise and UGK and all those guys took over. They started having their run. Okay. Then your Nellies, and then your and then you begin to have more. Um, in the 2010s, it was it was the uh, uh, 50 and not 50. Um, I didn't say 50. It took another change in the 2000s. Let's put it like that. It took another change, and then in 2015, it changed again, and in 2020, it changed Drake, again. Drake with the singing music and right. You know what I'm saying? Your Nipsey's, your, your Drake's, Meeks, and then you right. still got your Yachty's and your and your Lil Zans and your and your and your guy your amigos and things like that. So music is constantly changing. But the thing about music is, and I learned this by understanding Jay Z, you got to change with the times, but not change yourself. Right. Right. So Jay, yeah, Jay never he didn't change with the times to start. He didn't change and start making music like Yachty and them. He just right. started making music for his fan base, more mature, right. older. Open your mind up more. You know what I'm saying? Right. So that's why he's had longevity. And that's why, you know, a lot of people, Snoop, say what you want about Snoop, but Snoop has, a, has had longevity. One you know, he's had longevity. Cube has had longevity. These people have longevity because they look past the five years. Yeah. They didn't look at the five years and say, oh, they didn't look for right now. They look past right now. Right. And, and so the biggest thing is when it's all over, what happens? When there's no more money, there's no more hits, there's no more security, there's no more. You know, you have to live with the decisions that you make. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I don't wish anything on anyone. You know, I, I don't, that's not me. I'm, I don't wish that. But I, my uncle and my cousins always live by the rule of whatever you put out and you do, it's going to come back. Yeah. And one thing about uh, people, people will wait. Yeah. People will wait. They will wait. And they will, and they will, you know, 
wait. They'll wait. They'll wait. How many years it takes? They'll wait. Yeah, wait for opportunity to present itself. Yeah. Where they can go ahead and, and rectify yeah. whatever happened. Um, and, and I, I think that's, that's what's wrong with a lot of the young. Uh, uh, and like I say, I my son puts me up on a lot of music. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, I'm not my ear ain't to the to the right. young people like that. So he puts right. me up on a lot of music that I like. You know, I like Sada Baby. I like um, a lot of these uh, Polo G. Right. I like to be a young boy and 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 little baby. Them guys to me are they're all the new waves. I listen to great new wave. Yeah, I listen to them. I listen to those guys. And I like them, but I think a lot of a lot of young generation, other generations, it's that old versus young thing. All the old people hating on us, and they do. It's old. It is old people that be hating on them. One hundred. You know what I'm yeah. saying? But it, it, that ain't nothing new. You know, when when Pac and Biggie was out, everybody that was Rock Kim and Karis One fans were saying. People like us hate them. You know what I'm saying? 100%. Listen, I remember when I was I was probably seven or eight. And I remember like yesterday, my dad having a conversation with my, with my brother. And my brother was excited about like Run DMC or LLPK yeah. or somebody <laughs> like that. And my dad felt now, you know, what my dad said was go. Like if your dad said something. It was yeah. like this is guaranteed for a fact what it is can't be changed. It is cemented in stone, right? Yeah. And I'm eight, you know, I'm eight, nine, ten years old. So I'm super impressionable. And yeah. uh Superman begins to talk, my dad, and he's like, rap won't last. <laughs> like rap is is uh is you know it's, um, here it's today, fat. gone yeah. tomorrow. It is yeah. a fact, 100 yeah. percent I remember it so clearly, and it's the moment. It's the it's probably the moment in time where I realized my dad don't know everything. No, because I like in my heart of hearts I knew how good LL Cool J was. Mm -hmm. I knew how much like my brother loved LL Cool J, and mm -hmm. I didn't really love rapping music, but I I at that early age understood his emotional connection to the music, yeah. and he was ready to live the rest of his life on this mission to become a rapper. Like he, mm -hmm. like in, in that time, he was so dedicated to it. Yeah, so It was like, in, in my heart of hearts, I was like, my dad is wrong. Like he's mm -hmm. wrong, like, rap yeah. ain't going nowhere. Like this is for real, you know? So anyway, I said to say, it was his conditioning and his um, understanding of what music really was that right. was impacting his judgment on right. genre and his new culture. Mm -hmm. And that's why, like yesterday, I put up a post about Takashi 69 being the new generation's Lil Wayne, which I use Lil Wayne. Some people agree, some people don't. But my whole point in saying that was it was something that was unique and different, and people mm -hmm. didn't necessarily understand him, mm -hmm. but his fan base did. And at the mm -hmm. end of the day, like that's all that matters. Like the people yeah. that connect with um that yeah. connect on his level and understand mm -hmm. his awkwardness, his tattoos, his mm -hmm. his um his color, his hair, like all these things. Mm -hmm. Not I'm not talking about what he did because right, right. No, no, I get that part. I get what you're saying. From conversation. But before that happened, he was to somebody like me, he was weird. Like it just was like yeah. I didn't understand him. You didn't yeah, understand yeah. that music, but I just didn't understand them. And yeah, yeah. no knock, like, yeah. I don't understand you. I don't relate to you. I, However, I, I think, respect what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I think with, with it's, even in films, you, you get a, it, it's kind of like, I ain't gonna say it's the same thing, but it's just that I've learned to open up and understand the young, younger generation. You know what I'm saying? Why does my son like? Some songs that I don't like. That's the question. I try, to, I try to figure out why. Why does he like this? It sounds dumb. I don't like it. It's 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 stupid. Right. But when I started to open my eyes and start listening, it's what he can relate to. I can't relate to knowing. I, I can't relate to having a phone in class and and or whatever it is that that goes on. I can't relate to that. Right. He can. So right. what he can relate to is what he's going to attach to. Right. It might sound stupid to me. Right. Because I can't attach to it, I can't relate to it. But it doesn't mean it doesn't it doesn't mean that it's stupid to a global people, right? You know what I'm saying? With with the six nine situation is, I I don't necessarily I, I didn't I don't remember even liking much of his songs. Maybe one song, you know what I'm saying? I um, never even heard a whole six nine song. Yeah, he had one of my son used to play. Here, little snippets there, like yeah, my son used to. It was one song my son had liked, um, like three or four years ago when he first came out, but. When when 
all this happened, I'm gonna tell you what it taught me when all the six nine stuff happened and all that. It it gave me an opportunity to show my son everything I've been talking about. About hip hop is just stories. Yeah. Rap is just stories. Yeah. Entertainment. Yeah. The guys that are doing it, it's a very, very, very small percent that either really lived it or is still doing it. It's a very, very small percent. Mm -hmm. Right? So don't sit here and be, because you can you can be, I was, you can be influenced yeah. by so much that you want to start doing it and you miss reality of what really you're supposed to be doing, your opportunities that you have in front of you because you're so, you <clears> listen <throat> to it. Your, your body takes it in all day, every day. You right. listen to the same music. And so I told him, I said, that's a perfect example of someone who was not in the streets, who was not under, you know, he didn't grow up that way. He wasn't, you know, he he was he was just somebody that felt the fame. Right. They yeah, came through yeah, into the jungle, so to speak. In the jungle, and the jungle gave him validation. Mm -hmm. They gave him approval. They gave him that 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 false sense of security. Yeah. For him to be able to keep doing what he's doing that made him famous. Yeah. So what happened was he got so caught up in the situation, he didn't realize the severity of what he was in. Yeah. You're talking about real gang members. You're talking about real gangsters. You're talking about real life killers right. that you are around. And so if you are around these real life situations and you don't know nothing about it, <laughs> right. to you, them, you, you know they, you know what I'm saying? Right. Like whatever. And so when you break a violation or you break a code, you don't realize what you did. You don't right. understand the consequences. We finna take you and beat your ass. Right. We finna take you and now we finna now we finna you know terrorize you. Right. Because you didn't you don't know you didn't know you don't know you're not you didn't you didn't come up in that environment. You only right. been around that truly for a year, and when it turned on you, you didn't know you didn't know any other way of what yeah, to do yeah. or what you did. And, and you know Beyonce, I, I watched a clip from Beyonce um, not too long ago, and. I think she summed it up so like eloquently in a way that I never thought about it. And she was basically saying the way people internalize entertainers and art, whether that's acting, whether that's music, right? everyone now visually internalizes the person's story. So it's like, if I get to know you, through your tech, through your um, social media platforms, through Facebook, through Instagram, through all the different posts that you put out, and it's it has nothing to do with your craft. It's about mm -hmm. you with your family, it's yeah. you with your kids, it's you in the streets, it's you turning up, having a good time. That's mm -hmm. how I'm connecting to you emotionally. Like my brother yeah. connected to the words, to the music. He never. Right. Seen, he didn't see I saw that. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, I so, think I heard that clip. So it's yeah. a different, it's a different emotional connection, and I think. Our kids, what we don't understand, and what a lot of people who who look at them from the outside looking in don't understand is they're internalizing these people's crafts completely yeah. different than the way we did. And so, like Kanye, Kanye is another example. He's even an older example, but example of Kanye fans are so ride or die. Yeah, there's no <laughs> doubt that he. <laughs> He can do anything. Like he, he can, can say anything. Say, he said some of the craziest shit, and I'd be like, "What?" <laughs> right. And, I, and I, what, what makes me even more, I, you know, when he says, it, I just go, "Hey, I mean that 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 don't shock me." But what shocks me is his fans when they go, yes. hey, "What?" Yes. Like, what do you mean? Because like it's the relatable. But it's what you said about Jay Z. It is like we feel whether it's the truth or not. The right. perception of Kanye is he is being Kanye. Like if you if you sat in front of him, this is who he is going to be, regardless of what right. anybody thinks. That right. all it's probably not. to it's me, probably not who he is. yeah, and, and it's probably not. You know, it's like the Don, Donald Trump factor. It's yeah. like it, regardless of people, regardless of what people want to believe, we are attracted to realness and authenticity, authenticity. for the good or for the bad. Yeah. People, and, and, I, and I heard Beyonce say something, and I correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I know I am. But I believe she said that what you were just saying, but she, she has said music isn't music isn't storytelling anymore. Right. It, it is I, I believe, don't please don't quote because I could be wrong. It might not be her, but something about music is not being told in stories, it's not interesting anymore. It's just throw a beat on and say whatever you want. I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. But well, yeah, it, I mean, she, she did she did she did say that, but she was saying it more in the context of once upon a time, it was about stories and about yeah. 
listening yeah. to the voice. So you yeah. heard it being narrated and you didn't mm -hmm. care about what you what that person's life was like. Yeah, it's yeah. Totally yeah. About the music. And now yeah. it's just people putting stuff on paper because yeah. we like them because of their daily life and what yeah. they're doing. And, and, and like I said, it's it's internet, social media, and, and things like that have changed the, the 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 world so much though. Yeah. So social media has changed a lot of things. Right. Social media has it, you don't have to tell a story no more. Right. Your story is being told on social media. Yeah. If you make I'm a people telling your story for you. <laughs> Yeah, if you make a, a, a dope song, I mean a dope beat, and you get on there and just have a catchy hook with an a, a okay verse, you got a hit. Yeah. And that's a proven fact. You got a hit. You got a proven fact. But what I tell people all the time is, I never, one thing I was, I, I never knock the young generation for getting their money. Yeah. Every For every young um, minority that makes it out, makes it out of the struggle successfully uh, um, doing music or whatever it is, I root for them to stay in it. Right. Because that, that's another person that can go back and influence his neighborhood and the people in his neighborhood to do better. You know what I'm saying? So 100%. when I hear when I hear that, oh, I hate his music. He sucks. Not for you. It's just not for you. It's okay. It's not for you. It sucks to you. But there's 30 million people that believe it's great. So Clearly. who cares? Yeah. You know what I'm it sucks to you. I might not like him. Yeah, he sucks to me too. I don't like him. But I hope he's successful. And I hope he stays successful. You know what I'm saying? I don't wish that he could go and be broke. No, I don't wish that. Right. Because when you wish things like that, things like, I think the power of the tongue is everything. When you say, man, I wish I wish he would just, just be broke, never made it or whatever, whatever. Then what happens, you know, what happens to you? Right. You know what I'm saying? There's, there's, there's people that feel like they wish you was broke and wish yeah. you wasn't nothing. 100%. Yeah. So well, If you don't have people out there wishing that, you probably not. not yeah, you probably not. Right, exactly. So, <laughs> The young generation, I just feel like they got their own voice. Yeah. It's not, no, not bad or, you know, it's, it is what it is. It's not bad or good. It's just they have their own voice. They have a fan base. And sometimes some of them, they, they stay for longevity. And then some time of them, I mean, not longevity, but they, they've been in it for a while and they're still going. And then a lot of them just have one hits and they're gone. Right. But that one hit changed their life. And that nothing wrong with that. Yeah. You know, I, I know there's a lot of controversy over Eminem making his song, his, his records to bottom. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I know somebody was arguing with me, like, yeah, man, you know, uh, uh, M this, M, M did that. And, and M uh, is, is, is can, what do you say? He said, M uh, can stop them from doing this and that. I said, let me tell you something. M has been in the game 30 years. 30 M years. has the right to say whatever he wants. Yeah. <laughs> okay? That's his opinion. Yeah. M is a legend. He is whatever you want to, he's there, right? That is his opinion. And he's coming from an aspect of hip hop. He was in it. He did it. He has that right. You know what I'm saying? He can speak on it. That's like saying a boxer. I could say you suck as a boxer. I never boxed a day in my life. Right. What gives me the right to say you suck as a boxer? And I ain't never stepped foot in the ring and threw no jab and, and got in the mix. Right. You know what I'm saying? So what kind of and I tell people I'm saying, so what holds your validity? What, what makes you what you're saying valid? Right. You know what I'm saying? You can't compare yourself to M. M is a whole different situation. You can't compare to, to Dre or anybody that that these guys that say what they say about hip hop and the yeah. young artists, they have that right to say that because they're just trying to, some, most of them, they're just trying to help. Right. Help them have longevity. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And you get a lot that do hate though. So, that, and that, yeah, I'm about to say that's, uh, I mean, those are all, those are all facts. And um, it, it's crazy. Social media has just given, it's, it's made everybody experts, you know, to some degree <laughs> and uh, <laughs> giving everybody permission to voice their opinion. So, yeah. Um, you know, if you have an audience, you have people listening, then that makes you an expert. <laughs> I, tell you all, I tell you about all the time, man. You can have 50,000 followers, man. But the one thing about it is what they following you for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Followers don't turn into ticket sales all the time. Yep. True followers turn into ticket sales. Right. And that's and 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 speaking of sales, like let's uh let's transition because you know we can talk all day. I want to make sure we talk a little bit about um some of the new projects that you guys got. Um, your your endeavors with Moolah Films and all the great all the great projects that you guys have created and in a, and are in the process of creating. Um, yeah. First, tell us about um, you know what you tell me what you feel. You know you have birthday behavior. You had um, two eleven, like all these movies that has come out of the the mm -hmm. Films camp. Which product do you feel has been like the most successful for you personally? 
I think either from a writer or actor, because I know you've done all the different that, that, that I've done that I've been in. Cause see, I all of them is ours. Yeah. All of them. We all consider all of them ours. If we were in it or not, we had a hand in them some way or another. Right. Um I think it, it depends because I feel like Buffed Up is the most successful here. Okay. There, there's no film bigger than Buffed Up in Michigan. No film in our in our catalog that has more of a cult following than Buffed Up. Okay. Um, globally, like globally, it's between for me, it's between Birthday Behavior and uh and Plug Love. Okay. Are the two, you know, most successful to to me. Um, but again. To Eleven has done very has done great, you know. To Eleven has got, I think, over millions of views now on YouTube. Yeah. Um, because back then we didn't Eleven was kind of like that was kind of like the the baby, like that was the project that yeah that created all the opportunities for that's the one you know Forever Fast Life Tail God rest his soul that's the one where Murder Tail and and Day jumped off the porch first yeah and Shorty they jumped off the porch first and. They they blaze the trail yeah. for us that we following on now. So uh yeah, two eleven and then you know five oh was great. Five oh does very well as well. The mule's doing good, you know, mule just released, so it's right. still you know picking up its momentum, but it's doing great. Um and then McGraw Ave is 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 picking up momentum right now. So but most successful globally to me would be birthday behavior and, and uh plug love, and I think in Michigan it would be buffed up. So what what was your favorite project personally? That's a tough one. That's tough right there. I don't know. Uh I love them all, man. I can't really say. Like I had a lot of fun on Buffed Up. That was like day in and day out was just constant fun. Right. Constant like laughing and just it was just a great experience. 5-0 was like a film I always wanted to do, like action-packed, fighting and shooting and, you know, running down, running chase scenes. And right. that was like every day was like a workout. Yeah, the dream. I loved it. Yeah. Um, even Plug Love, I loved it, how the story was being told. I, I, I loved being on Plug Love set when I was there. Um, and then Birthday Behavior was dope. I, I, man, I don't know, man. I can't say, man. But Birthday Behavior was amazing to work with those ladies and – and the cast and and the mule was the same thing. It was funny, constant day in and day out of just having fun. The, the, thing, the thing I love most, you know, about me kind of being on the outside and just watching. I mean, because I, I mean, I've literally been yeah. there since. Yeah, you've been there since the, since the very very jump. Listen, T, and I don't even know if you know this or not. T set would sit in my barbershop as like. He probably was even a teenager. Like I don't even like T might have been a teenager sitting in the barbershop, super shy, wouldn't say two words. And uh I remember seeing him and, and just wondering, like this kid who always walked around with a chip on his shoulder. And then yeah. one day I just feel like he started talking. And I mean, this probably wasn't re was really happening, but this was who I saw at yeah. the top. So this is like my yeah. version of him. Yeah. And, uh, to watch it go from that to the T that we know now, and then to all watch this uh this machine if you will just become so polished and like the execution yeah. and like the amount of time that it takes to create a project like to yeah. me like that's success like to me yeah. like you like if you had yeah. to tell a story of success i don't care mm -hmm. what happens from this point on because i know it's much bigger and better things mm -hmm. um, watch that go from literal scratch zero nothing and then to grow into what it has evolved into now is just like, well, he wasn't that quiet when I met him. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> he wasn't like that when I met him. He was he was very vocal. But one thing, um, when me and T linked up back in 2010, we were making a movie called Concrete. Me, T, Henri, Anton, and BZ. Right? right, we met T and B through Anton, right. and we were making a movie called um, Concrete. You know, we always say the greatest movie that never came out. You know, yeah, yeah. I wanted to see that. Yeah, Concrete. Full of, full of, Listen, listen, let me tell you a quick story before you, you go into the rest. Concrete, we premiered in 2012. Um, you was there at Lewis Hensley. Oh, Lewis yeah, that's right. We did at his, at, his, at his show. Yeah. Video premiere. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We played that's the concrete right. trailer on the red yeah. carpet. Yeah. Uh, we were, everybody, like that was, concrete was supposed to be 211, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, one of the, one thing about it is that, um, so T, 
when me and T first met, it was like two of the same people. We had the same grind. We had the right. same mentality. We had the same. Our chemistry was crazy. Like at one point, if you seen him, you seen me. If you was on, if we was doing videos, like I started off in videos with T. Yeah. That's how I learned uh, cinema, like filmmaking. Right, is through him, and right. so. We was like always together. I'm coming in with the with the this is how you do it, this is how you do it. He coming in with the it was just like two peas in a pot. So they yeah. say like you know how they say two brothers are always you you and your brother are always two peas in a pot. Me and T was like brothers. That like we was always together, right? Like day in day out working, getting better. And I and I think people don't understand. We sacrificed years and years and years of family time, family reunions, sports, so on, so on, because we were working, right. It didn't matter rain, sleet, snow. It didn't matter. We were working, right. and we're like that to this day. Me and him, me and him are like this. You know what I'm saying? We work constantly, talk every day. We working. Yeah, it's just like me and Kurt, like you and T. Me yeah, and yeah. Like the, the the fire isn't even the fire is more now that we yeah. we the, the, it's you know how you say you got to reignite. No, the fire is lit. Right. But one thing about uh me and T, I'll tell you uh. A little quick story is that in 2000, after concrete, a lot of things happened and everybody separated. Mm -hmm. Even me and T, we separated. Mm -hmm. And um, and I remember mm -hmm. it was like a year had passed, like three months, no, six months. I had seen him at a football game. And it's funny because you know how when you see like your, your guy, your homeboy, but y'all really ain't speaking. Right, right. What up, what up? But y'all both really want to be like, man, what's up, dog? Yeah, yeah. So we didn't follow nothing bad. It was just, we just separated. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to tell you how God works. A year later, he was in my neighborhood shooting a video for some guys. And I said, you know what, man? Forget this. I hopped up. I went over there. And I swear to goodness to you, it was like nothing ever happened. From that day on, we never stopped. We never stopped working together again. Yeah. Never. We've never stopped. We we because at the end of the day, when we chopped it up and we really talked, we needed that break so that mm -hmm. we could see. So you can appreciate each other. And and we've never even stopped working with each other. We've never stopped, never even thought about it. Yeah. Um, and so I say that say over the years, T has been something to me that that uh, nobody's ever been, which is the business. He taught me the business. He taught me. He made me look at things like look at it like this. He right. never you know, I didn't learn that in school. I didn't learn business. So when I learned that with him, when I was learning with him and we were talking and I do my own research, I started to understand. Damn. Right. Oh, that's why. Or, oh, OK. And so. Yeah. That guy really is the person that taught me my business side. Right. He taught me the business of this. You know what I'm saying? It's him. And it's like that whole situation, murder. I always talk about murder. People always ask me why I talk about murder. I talk about murder because murder is a type of guy. I first seen him and I told him, I said, bro, you have a talent that I've never seen. Like you have it naturally. It's just naturally in you. Mm -hmm. You know, some people have just natural talents. He is yeah, naturally right. talented, like right. naturally. With, with and everything, everything though, like not just movies, like he like that with everything. No, he he look, murder can rap. I don't, people might not know that, but he can go 100 like literally. Fact. And so I, I mean, I told him, I said, bro, you 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 gonna be that guy. You up, you up. And I kept telling him all the time. And so when I hit a low, you know what I'm saying? I think uh, it was about like 2000 and I can't remember, but I hit a low, right? He was probably one of the only people that constantly called or would text me every out, out the blue. Like, hey, what's up, bro? You good? Yeah, I'm telling him, hey, you know you to go. You know, he'd always just say things to keep my spirits up. Right. And fast forward 20 years from now, me and him, we, same thing. That's my guy. I, I, I root for him more than I root for myself sometimes. That's you know what I'm saying? But I say that to say that if you don't have guys like that around you, you're not going to be successful. It's hard. You got to have people around you that are going to be like that because they're not only are they – you know, in my corner, as far as they 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 give me the the um, what do you say, the confidence or things like that, or the you know, I got your back, I got this, but they also tell you when you're wrong. Right. And and I, I, feel like, I feel like I feel like with T man, y'all got a little like baby Michael Jordan over there. Um, if you watching this, <laughs> if you watching this documentary, and it's like T's T's level of his level of of expectation is like so high. And yeah. I think sometimes it's like he don't even realize like what you're doing is, is not human. Like no, you can't not. Work. listen, man. T you can go on set. I've, I've never seen anybody. Not, I'm not lying. You can ask anybody that has worked. Right, you know how hard I work, and I like I I bow down to. I think T probably Bro, one of the dudes that work. Yeah, listen. Every single person, 
that has ever stepped foot on our set has went to sleep on one of those back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back days of filming all day and night long. Right. Except him. I have never seen anybody. Yeah. And then they'll go, it felt like three days straight of no, oh, excuse me, no sleep on set. Yeah. I fell out like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Murder, Lance, Missy, uh, name them. They've all yeah. fallen asleep. And then you, when you wake up, you be like, "He's still going, he's God, still going. no, he's still going." No, but but he I'll motivates run. us. When he gets like that, he motivates us. He motivates me. He motivates murder. He yeah. motivates us. He yeah. he's he's the driving force of Moolah Films. Period. Yeah. It's, no, it's no it's no if ands or buts about it. He motivates. So, us. so, so um, transitioning to our final topic, which is you kind of going into this new role of coaching, and yeah. I feel like just on the outside looking in, I feel like it's reignited your flame for movie and film and all the different things that um, you mm -hmm. guys are doing. What, where did that come from? Was that always kind of the plan or did you just figure, like find a void in the uh, to kind of step into that role? No, I, I don't think it was the plan. I don't necessarily believe it was the plan. I think it kind of just happened. I think what we did uh, about two or three years ago, uh, me and T were saying we wanted to um, grow in the craft. You know, say so we wanted to grow as far as actors. You know, our, our our guys that we work with a lot. We wanted to kind of give them the opportunity to grow in the craft. Mm -hmm. So we we need to be able to teach them new things, new techniques. So I took what I did from school, and I just you know I did a, a fresh a refresh course and and um, studied up and stuff, and just you know started to pull out some old notes and things like that. And I said, let's do it. And so he said, all right, cool. You teach it. Me and you gonna put the sessions together, and then we're gonna have these sessions with our core actors. Two or three hours a day, two days a week. Bet, let's do it. So three years ago, we started working like that. And I can't remember who said it. I don't know if it was murder. I don't know if it was Sino. I don't remember. But one of them started calling me coach. Gotcha, coach. Gotcha, coach. And so we all laughed. I didn't, you know, we were just thinking about it. And right. three years now, they've been calling me coach. Right. Gotcha, coach. Coach. Yeah. All right, coach. And so now it's just like, I. it was funny. We laughed about it. But now it's like, that's really what they call me now is coach. All right, coach. We got you, coach. For sure, yeah. coach. And so I kind of took that and said, you know, I appreciate it. I was grateful. I was I was blessed that somebody would look at me as someone who could help them right. become a better actor. Like I I was I was honored by that. Right. And, and so fast forward about two years ago, I think we were talking about maybe holding classes to help the community, help actors in the community, because we always said, What what's out here to help actors in this community? Like what? Like the classes that that we inquired about or looked into they cost ridiculous amounts right and then after it's over with you don't even have an opportunity they don't even present you with an opportunity to go do a film or anything right for the most part i'm not speaking on all of them but for the most part it, it's expensive it's a lot and so um we said well let's make something that's affordable and that's geared towards our demographic people that want to you know that can't afford 1500 2000 or ten thousand dollar classes right. let's give them a fifteen hundred dollar worth course for $200. Let's do that. Let's give them opportunities to be in films after this. Let's teach them the things that we teach our people. And so when we did it, you know, we had a great first session. Second session was great. Then come back this year, we had another, we had 50 this year. So we grew two by double. I mean, I'm sorry. I think the first year was 25 and 20, the first two sessions. And the third session, which was this year, which was one session, um, was 50 people. Dope. So it kind of just happened. And I kind of just got tired of seeing um, people make decisions based on other people's uh, experiences that has nothing to do with the community here. Like they, they've never been an independent actor. They've never even done it. They've never right. even chased it. They chase their situation. That has nothing to do with the situation that you're trying to chase. And when I see that, I, bet I see it so much five years, six years, seven years down the line, they got regular jobs now. They don't act no more. They quit because they didn't they couldn't make it because they they went the wrong route. Right. You know what I'm saying? And, and if you were going to go that route, then you needed to go that route this way. You try to do this and go that route. You can't. It's, it's, it's not going to happen. So I said, I got to I got to just I can't hold my voice no more. I can't hold my tongue. I got to speak because I remember it's crazy because like you said, you learn through experiences. I remember me, you, T and Henri was outside a park bar one time yep. and we had that conversation about extras on set. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah, I do. Like yesterday. Yeah, we had the conversation. And I remember I was, this is before, you got to think this is eight, nine years ago. 
Mm-hmm. And I remember me and you was just me, you and Irene T. We was just debating like a month. Why you? Why would you go on set to be an extra and this and that? And I remember saying to myself, I don't have to go on a on a Hollywood set to make a good movie. Now, should you go on there if you have the opportunity and you have the time? Of course. Go see what it's like. I wouldn't, no, no doubt. Do you right. have to? No. Should you? Not if you're chasing what you're chasing, because you're not gonna have time. Right. You're not gonna have time to do that if you're working on your stuff. Right. Because your stuff has no time to take breaks. You gotta do it 365. Right. So and, you don't have time. And, and depending on what your vision is, because I like that yeah. particular conversation, you know, yeah. I, think, I think you know it was it was T very strong on one side, and I think it was Henri very strong on the other, and I think we were kind of playing the middle. And now in hindsight, I see that as very clearly two things. Do you want to be an actor or do Mm -hmm. you want to create the movies that the actors act in, which is two completely different visions, you know, because if you're going to create the jobs, you can do whatever the heck you want. You know, years ago, I was still on. I I wasn't on the fence, but I was still not where I'm at now mentally as far as what I know about independent filmmaking. I wasn't even there. Right. I was still like, damn, well, you know, Hollywood is. I didn't understand it. Yeah. Until like we, gonna, we gonna, T was like, we're gonna create the model. Like we're yeah. gonna build the model yeah. that makes people successful. Yes, and, and I remember I remember like yesterday. I remember 211 took off and then buffed up took off and then plug up took it off. And it was just like because I always see I've always been a, a, a guy that doesn't want to wait on nobody. So yeah. I've always been like that. I'm not I don't care who you are, I'm not waiting on you. I'm gonna go do it myself. Right. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna move. Yeah, and so yeah, he when he created. I mean, when we did our first film and it did what it did, it it just was like, okay, we on the right track. Oh, let's keep doing. It. Let's keep doing. It. Let's go. Make another. Make another. Little did we know. I don't think we didn't even know this back seven eight years ago. Streaming was going to be what it is now. Right. So not only were we in the right direction, but we got leverage. Yeah, you're ahead of the game. Leverage is the streaming sites that need the content. Yeah. So as long as we keep building our fan base and making good films. The leverage is the streaming sites giving us the door to premiere our stuff right. globally. Right. Right. You don't have to go to a middleman anymore. You don't have to have the middleman take it, give it to. No, you go right to the source. Yeah. So I think a lot of people that had that mentality back then have changed their, their mentality. I think they see it now. What well, me and T used to preach back then. Because back then, me and T used to preach it, but we had nothing that was backing it as far as the streaming sites. We didn't have that. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? We just had this is what our DVD so this is what we did. We didn't have, yeah, we did where well, there was no blueprint, like there was no template, right? You know, we, we were, never, we're in the know. process of creating the template in the book. Exactly. We couldn't say, you know, oh yeah, you know, we got the number one trending independent film on Amazon Prime right now. Wasn't no Amazon Prime 10 years ago, right? Wasn't no, wasn't no Netflix wasn't taking. Remember, Netflix wasn't taking independent films like that. Mm-hmm. So fast forward 10 years now, what we were preaching then is now actually what's going on. Yep. Even Hollywood yep. has dibbled and dabbled. Is is not dibbled and dabbled. Is streaming now? Isn't a right. lot of this stuff is on streaming sites as far as originals? Right. You know they're they're giving money. Big studios are backing yep. Netflix, Hulu originals, things like that. So yep. we seen it a long time ago. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you definitely. I mean, UT, like y'all, y'all pioneered a space that w- didn't exist. You know, and um, that's a, a lot of my conversation now about you know, with COVID-19 and people not understanding the, the power of just virtually communicating, whether that's whether that's a conference, whether that's um, a party, whether that's um, performing yeah. your songs live, like this is a space that will happen out of necessity. Like yeah. it's going to happen. It's just yeah. who's going to have the belief like T did enough in themselves to push it forward, regardless yeah. of what all everybody is saying about it not being sustainable or it can't work. Like yeah. you gotta have so much belief in yourself and your ideas yeah. that no matter what's happening around you, you're gonna yeah. have enough skin in the game and work hard enough yeah. to kind of see it through. So, and that comes with that just comes with you knowing your 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 data, then your mm-hmm. research and data on what you've been doing. Yeah. If you if you it, one thing I, I I tell you, I learned this from T. I I learned so much from me is know your re, you know you gotta know your research. Yeah. You gotta study your study your your your, your data. You gotta study it. Yeah. How are you gonna know what you did? How are you gonna know how you're moving or what's moving? Study other things. Study the things that you're the lane you're in. Study the analytics and data. Do your research. You know what I'm saying? What is what is the 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 people that study this? That the people that 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 um 
research is saying about streaming sites. Are they growing or are they dying out? No, they're growing and they're growing fast. <laughs> yeah. So what that means new, one, new ones, the, the telltale sign is like new platforms are popping up left and Everywhere. right. That's when you know. Like that's when so you that know. Means, okay, so if that means that they're, they're, there's new streaming sites every month, then that means they need content, original yep. content. Yep. You know what I'm saying? So that means they need more content. So that means you need to make more films. Yep. It, you know, and I always tell people, people say, people ask me all the time, you know, uh, should I become an independent filmmaker? Yes. If you're going to put in the time, right. yes. Right. Yes. Yes, the opportunity is now because 10 years from now, it ain't going to be, and I ain't going to say easy because it's hard, but it ain't going to be this as uh, accessible or, or right. opportunities or 10 years. Because one thing about a, 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 something that's lucrative or something that, that can be lucrative or open up, people jump on it. Yes, they're going to flip fast. Yep. And so 10 years, it might not be this easy to just go and get a film and be a filmmaker. You right. don't know. The systems are getting put in place to make yeah. it easier. So as yeah. the process becomes easier to get your get your content to market and to, and to make it go, you know, and, and to me, like the secret sauce that we don't a lot of people don't realize or understand or talk about is what we talked about at the very beginning, a true audience, yes. like a core following, yeah. you yes. know, and mm -hmm. that's what that's what you guys have. That's really, to me, what makes all of the Moolah Films projects so successful is because yeah. at the end of the day, the base audience is going to actually going to always give it a look, and then yep. they're going to you know from that point, if it's a great project, they're going to talk about it, you know, yeah. and that's the I advantage mean, I think that uh, y'all have that a lot of people don't have. Yeah, I, not, and I, I was the things that I talk about is things that mostly I'm guilty of. Mm -hmm. You know, what I'm saying I'm guilty of chasing the fame in the beginning. I'm, I'm guilty of that. You know, what I'm saying I used to be like, damn, I only got. 3,000 followers, but I never looked at it like I got 3,000 loyal followers. Right. My 3,000 loyal followers will make me more financially stable than your 30,000 followers. All day, all day, every day. And when I start learning, like again, I didn't know the business. When you don't know business, you you, you think not, you, you think you just guess. Right. So in your mind, 1.2 million followers in your mind is like, whoa, dog. That person is it can can sell out arenas and whatever right. you think in your mind, right. not knowing that this guy who has a hundred thousand followers will sell out more tickets than that person with one point two million, because he has a hundred thousand true followers. I always say about the guy, what's his name? Danny Brown, the, the artist, yep. the rapper. Yep. Love, I love what he does. He has a true following. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have fifty million followers. He doesn't. He has a. I guarantee you that guy can sell more tickets than. 90, I ain't gonna say 90 percent, but a lot more people than, that has millions of followers. I bet you he could sell more tickets. Yeah, he has a true following that love his music, right? That love him as an artist, right? I see, I remember when he didn't have a hundred thousand followers. I remember when he didn't, you know, I remember hearing his name like Danny Brown, he on fire. I remember this, mm -hmm. you know, and now I, I he has true followers. He's the mean, he's one of the people I say is the meaning of having true followers, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and so I was faulty of it though, I was faulty of chasing the, the fame. Until I had to learn the business. When you learn the business, forget the fame. It ain't even about the fame. It's about understanding your position and what you're trying to do. One hundred percent. Like I was just having a conversation with uh with this guy named Tyler Harris, and uh, I mean he, he probably has like sixty thousand followers. Not that that matter. He's an insurance salesman. Like he's wow. an insurance broker, and yeah. all he does is create content. But his content is so real and authentic, mm -hmm. and talk about. You know, being yeah. an alcoholic and like yeah. divorce and all these different things. And yeah. uh, he mentioned something in that conversation, and he was basically like, "Listen, if I could turn off that thing, I would." I've never looked at the amount of people that's following me because I really don't care. Like I'm, yeah. just, I'm just sharing my, my story, story yeah. to yeah. the best of my ability, mm -hmm. and. Yeah. Uh, you know, whatever, whoever yeah. feels like that's adding value to their life and they want to follow that, then that's what it's really yeah. about. And I think that's kind of the difference between doing it for the numbers and for the fame versus yeah. doing it as either an outlet or yeah. as a way to really inspire and educate and help the people that's that's. Um, yeah, and I think I think social media, it's about all time, man. Social media can, what social media can do in a negative way is take away the beauty of learning the craft of acting. Yeah, like, there's a beauty in that. That's like learning learning a game of basketball. Mm -hmm. If you become a two K sensation on social media and you have 
uh, a million followers who follow you because you're the best 2K player. And then you say, hey, I'm about to go play basketball in this tournament with these the dudes that play on ESPN uh, for the for the $2 million. You know right. what I'm talking about. Yeah. I'm about to go play with them. And you get out there, you're going to embarrass yourself. Right. Because you never learned the craft and the beauty of how to dribble a ball. Right. How to shoot a jump shot. To learn the game of basketball, you didn't learn the, the 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 game of basketball. So when you get out there in the real situation, right, right, you're gonna make a fool of yourself. So when you do it again the second time, so let's and always be this. Think about it like this: you might get a nice crowd to go out there, but when you go embarrass yourself, your crowd's never coming back and buying another ticket. Yeah, because because you, you misled them. So yeah. I always say that to, to to with the skits when people do the skits and they get a big huge following, it's beautiful. And I tell them. Make sure, make sure as you as you grow, because you should go off and do films. You should become an actor. Learn it though. Right. Learn the craft. Practice. Work on it. Be good. If you're a comedian, skit. Learn stand up comedy. Study the art of stand up comedy. Learn how to do it. Because right. now you have you have fans who love what you do, and now you're trying to transition them from skit to stand up comedy, and that's tough. Because if you bomb, then you only right. can be skit for until you until you can try to build back up being successful as a comedian. Right. So learn the art and the craft that you're going into. Learn it, study it, learn it, try to perfect it, and and you can always use your following. Use your following for whatever it is you're trying to endeavor. But just whatever you're trying to endeavor, you have to transition. Yeah. Because I'm gonna tell you, if you're a fisherman and you got a billion followers on there for fishing, or me, I'm not. But if you got a hundred thousand followers for fishing, and you go do a movie about. You are you are a, a drug addict. They're probably not gonna come see you be a drug addict. Because that's the way they follow you. They One follow two. you because you're the greatest fisherman <laughs> on earth. Right. Now, can you become a great actor and, and transition your followers? Yeah, but it's, it, it, you gotta it's gonna take time and work. You can't. You know what I'm saying? I see a lot of people do that. They they build, 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 and then they jump and do this, and then it doesn't work out, and they gotta jump back to doing this. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because it just it. It doesn't work like that. Yeah, and, and it's, I, not, it's not authentic. Yep, people yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that's that's the business part. That's where the business part come in. Yeah. Instead of you going, I got 100,000 followers who love me for this. Now, watch my stories. Hey, y'all, taking my first acting class. Y'all, I'm about to do this acting thing. Let it build up right. for about a year or whatever. And then say, hey, I got my first gig in the movie. They're going to come see you because they seen right. you working. They seen you building. Right. And they're like, oh, he going from skits to actually doing acting classes. Ooh, I want to see. I want to see. Right. Right. Well, Docu exactly. Docu document that process and that growth. Yeah. It's like you said, they want to see authenticity. They want to see being. They want to see it. They want to see the transition for themselves. But if you right. if you do skit skit skit, and then tomorrow you go, I'm in a new movie. You might get some, but what if you bomb? Right. You're terrible. Nobody's gonna come. You, you should have never did that. <laughs> no, no. But you know what? If you go to acting classes, or if you go to whatever, and you build it, and they see you working hard, they're gonna be less critical on you. Yeah. You know why? Because they seen the process of you doing what you were doing, and they understand he got he 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 not bad. He got a little work. He got to get a little work. Yeah. He gonna be all right. Because remember, people look for negative things to say. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. But when you show them the process, they respect. They, they respect. They respect the process. They so, respect. They respect yeah. that process. Sure. If you if you show them what you, they respect it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. For sure, man. Look, yeah. I. You know, like you said, we can talk for hey, hours. You know how we roll. We can talk for hours. And I, I know, uh, I'm sure you got a lot of things going oh, on. Yeah. So I don't want to hold you up, but um, give give everybody your the ways to follow you, and then also anything that you want them to go check out. Like, leave. Let's leave on that note. Okay. Uh, like I said, Thomas L. Harris. Um, you can follow me on on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. It's all the same, Thomas L. Harris. I think Twitter might be Director Thomas L. Harris, but Instagram and uh, Facebook is Thomas L. Harris. Every Sunday night, I do a forum called Coach's Corner on my IG Live, on my Facebook Live. It's 30 minutes. I talk about everything. Tonight is, are you chasing the fame or are you chasing, are you in it for the fame or the craft? Right? Are you chasing the fame or are you chasing the craft? That's Coach's Corner tonight. Tune in, my IG Live at 7 p.m. Um, McGraw Ave, series episode four and five premieres tonight. Four and five. We're doing two back-to-back -back premieres tonight on Vimeo On Demand. The link is in our bios. Um, Mula Films, Murder, Pain, um, my bio. Um, yeah, man. And Mule. Mule's on, on, on a, uh, Amazon Prime right now. So, you know, go go check out all our films, you know, and we appreciate everybody. We appreciate you, Rob, for all the years you've been, you know, supporting us. You know what I'm saying? We appreciate it. Even the, uh, me and you just having business convos, man. Because I've learned, you know, I learned a lot of marketing from you, you know, especially digital marketing. I've learned a lot. 
Like you're the one that put the digital marketing into my mind about how to digitally market things. No doubt. You know, especially for my outside businesses. So yeah. So just appreciate you guys, man. Appreciate you. And yeah, that's that's how you can reach us, man. No doubt, man. Well, look, I, I enjoyed this conversation a lot. We got to do it again soon. Yeah, we got to, man. We got to get our we got to get our uh film project um complete. Yes, we do. Oh, <laughs> we do gotta get that done, man. We shot a, a teaser trailer and everything for that thing, man. Yeah, man. Do you know? Do you know that that trailer got fifty thousand views on YouTube? No, I didn't know that. Yes, uh, change, change your heart. Fifty thousand views, and no one's ever promoted it one day. And they got. Yeah, we, might, we might have to have a conversation about that. One. Yeah, let's we bring that one back to the table, dog. We definitely, we definitely yeah. need to talk, man. So, if T, if you listening or when you see this, let's let's make that happen. Yeah, come on, Mula. I'm gonna call you actually. I'm gonna call you. <laughs> hey, man. Yeah, man, 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 man. Rob just called me, man. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm gonna text him too. Hey, go yeah. enjoy the rest of your day with your family. You too, man. I'll Tell the wife happy Mother's Day, Mother's Day, man. Happy we Mother's will. Day to the wife and everybody, man. We will for sure. You have a good one, bro. I'll talk to All you. All right, soon. you too, brother. All right, peace. That wraps up. We could have talked for probably the next two hours, but um, always great catching up with Thomas. They doing some incredible things. If you watch one movie on Amazon Prime, Buffed Up, Two Eleven, um, uh, Birthday Behavior. If you watch any of his movies, you will get all the other movies popping up, and I guarantee you'll be hooked. Like they out uh, incredible projects over there in that camp. So, um, shout out to Thomas, shout out to uh, T Murder, um. Um, all the entire team that's um, giving the city just you know something to be proud of. So, um, thank you for joining us this morning. I'm sure today a lot of people are out, um, you know, with their families and doing a lot of things. And so, catch this replay. You can catch us on YouTube, uh, Robert Courtney at podcast.com. And uh, join us tomorrow at 10 a.m. for another great conversation with my main man, um, who I call. Social media before social media, Mr. Chuck Bennett himself. All right. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a great day. And uh, these are our conversations to keep you going. Good boy, Robert Gordon.